Hi friends. Hello friends, welcome again. And I'm really honored today to introduce you to my friend, uh, Dr. Jim Doty. He has been my mentor on the path of compassion and to understand the neural underpinnings of compassion and these compassionate practices. And uh, it was indeed a privilege for me when I first saw the newspaper item, I think it was 2010 or 11, that there was going to be a center for compassion and altruism research and education starting at Stanford with support from or co-founded by Dr. Jim Doty and uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I just could not sleep that night and I sent a message to Jim saying, I don't know you, but I want to help in whatever way I can. Compassion changed my life. And Jim responded within a couple of days and uh, it's, it's been a delightful journey. It changed me in ways I cannot describe. So Jim, tell us about you. Um, how did you get on this path? You were already a very successful uh, neurosurgeon, um, also a professor and had been an entrepreneur with the whole, um, you know, bringing laser neurosurgery to the masses. What brought you on the path of compassion and uh, what, was, what was your motivation? Well, you know, it's funny you use the certain term success, and I think for many people, uh, success can be a very confusing term. Uh, a lot of people believe that success uh, relates to accomplishments in society, such as wealth, power, what type of job you have, what type of car you have, what neighborhood you live in, and they get lost in this belief that the acquisition of things somehow uh, means your success and also that these are associated with happiness and sadly uh, as many people find out once they have all of these things they feel that they're failures and they're unhappy and so I think uh, one has to be careful about those terms success and happiness for myself as you pointed out I, I have accomplished many things which in Western society would be perceived as being successful. Uh, and of course we have a um, capitalist, in some ways a ruthless capitalist uh, uh, country and one that sometimes is not so kind. And, um, and success is oftentimes uh, denoted by uh, things, what you have. For me, uh, I, began my journey as a child uh, and for many of us our backstory is an indicator of what our future story is or who we are today and certainly that's the case with me. Uh, I grew up as you know in a very challenging background with a father who was an alcoholic and a mother who had had a stroke when I was a child and she was paralyzed and had a seizure disorder unfortunately uh, chronically depressed attempted suicide multiple times uh, neither of my parents had gone to college, and uh, we were on public assistance my entire childhood. Um, my father was arrested many times. Uh, we were evicted from different uh, residences, and certainly, uh, and unfortunately, uh, there are too many people in those types of circumstances, too many children. And the reality is that when you grow up in such an environment, the likelihood for you overcoming uh, those challenges is, uh, it's highly, highly unlikely. And in addition to it being highly unlikely, the nature of that repeated trauma, that chaotic environment actually, uh, puts baggage on you. You feel you're not good enough. You're not smart enough that somehow it's your fault. And, um, you lose your ability to imagine what's possible because of despair, hopelessness, lack of access, poverty, et cetera. What changed for me and what me allowed me to be with you today is that at the age of 12, carrying this burden of shame <clears throat> and uh, fear and anxiety, I walked into a magic shop and the owner wasn't there, but his mother was there. And um, <clears throat> she knew nothing about magic. Uh, this was a store that was quite a ways from where I lived in a strip mall. I'd never seen it before. I had an interest in magic. Anyway, her and I began chatting. And the thing about this woman, unlike so many people who 
we often meet, uh, she was completely non-judgmental. Uh, even though I wasn't dressed particularly well, even though I was 12, she treated me uh, with a radiant smile uh, as an equal and who seemingly was as interested in my opinion as she would be an adult's opinion. And the very nature of that interaction created this environment, which now we call psychological safety. And when you grow up in a traumatic environment, uh, like I did, uh, psychological safety is, is very important. And after asking several penetrating questions, uh, she then indicated to me that she was going to be there during the summer. And if I showed up every day, uh, she would teach me something that she thought could be helpful. And the extraordinary thing about this was that this was in the late 60s. Uh, and um, before we talked about mindfulness or meditation or neuroplasticity, and basically what she ended up doing, because I did show up every day for a few hours with her in the back room of this magic shop, she taught me several things. One was a breathing practice and a way to relax my body, which now are typically associated with mindfulness practice. And, um, and the reality was that prior to that, uh, I could not attend. It was hard to be present because I was thinking about what might happen. Uh, you know, when you grow up in my environment, there's constant uncertainty, which creates fear and which stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. And as a result, you're always wondering what's going to happen next uh, because you feel you have no control. And uh, so this, through this breathing exercise, through this uh, body survey and relaxation, it allowed me to attend and be present. And, you know, so many people have such difficulty with that because they're either thinking about what could have been, might have been, should have been, or a future that has not yet occurred yet. And the very nature of those two things not only creates stress and anxiety, but allows you not to be present. And uh, if you're not present, you miss out on the present. And uh, it's very unfortunate because when you're with somebody who is really with you in present, it's really quite an extraordinary experience. And uh, so that was the first thing she taught me. The second thing she taught me was that the negative dialogue that I had going on in my head, which I believed was truth and was me, uh, in fact, was a false narrative. All the statements I made about being not good enough and not smart enough, et cetera, et cetera, unfortunately, are a side effect and a manifestation of our evolution as a species because what happens is negative things stick to you uh, and in some way that's protective you know if you are out in the savannah in africa and there's a lion who you know uh is moving the grass and you've had that experience uh you know what to do and so it sticks to you this potential risk the problem is that the same happens if you hear statements or someone says something to you that's negative, you have a tendency to have that stick to that negative narrative stick to you. And she made me realize that that narrative um, was false, that it didn't represent me. And essentially, she taught me self-compassion, uh, that I deserved to be loved. I uh, was worthy of affirmation, that I uh, had immense power. And uh, in some ways, what she did was made me realize that every time I make a negative statement, it's as if I'm putting a, a brick to build a wall or a prison. And what happens is when you lay those bricks down, the number of your possibilities start decreasing. And, uh, and it also becomes a very dark place. And so when she taught me this uh, reality, she taught me, how to be kind to myself, to accept myself for who I am. And uh, also essentially, if you will, gave me the key out of prison and to understand that I had unlimited possibilities, which is true of all of us. So that really uh, was quite extraordinary. And then uh, from there, she taught me uh, how to manifest my intention. And you know, now if you look at sports psychologists where they talk about visualization, you write your aspirations down, your goals, you say them, you relive them in your mind. Uh, using all of your senses, what that does is create the um, 
subconscious uh, motivator, which allows you to really hear all the different opportunities and to understand uh, the power you have. You know, it's interesting it, that, um, as an example, uh, if you're at a party and someone says your name, you immediately turn, uh, even though there's tons of noise around because your identity is deeply embedded in you. And the thing is, when you manifest your intention, when you can deeply embed these goals, these aspirations, uh, what happens is that your brain starts listening more because we don't appreciate it, but we receive tens of millions of bits of information through our senses every second. But the fact is we are only able to process 50 to 100. So what happens is you ignore so much going around you, but when your intention is uh, put deep into your subconscious, you are tuned to information related to that intention and that gives you a much more likelihood of uh, manifesting that. So all of those techniques she taught me uh, allowed me to uh, uh, succeed, if you will, uh, but more importantly, to see what I call the true nature of reality. And what do I mean by that? The problem is that, as I mentioned earlier, we get lost in what success is or happiness is. And additionally, because most of us are not kind to ourselves uh, and are very hard on ourselves, what happens is that we have a tendency to be, be more critical of other people and not recognize that they are suffering as well. And as a result, we have a tendency to be very judgmental and uh, not realize that oftentimes the negative interaction we have with another human being really has nothing to do with me. Uh, they may have had a bad experience earlier in the day, they may have indigestion, and they don't. you don't appreciate that the actions another is doing uh, many times has no relationship to what you're actually talking about. Wow, you answered so many questions I was going to pose. So let me then jump to the next one. First of all, I want to thank you because uh, the gift that you received from this woman, from this mentor, or in India, we would be tempted to use the word guru, but somebody who really meant good for you, it's, I, I see it getting returned a thousandfold, 10,000 fold. You have been a mentor to thousands of people, including me, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, interestingly also, um, we are in extraordinary times right now. Um, the kind of challenges you went through were not everybody goes through that. I went through a much milder version of that. I had a mother who was suffering from mood disorders, serious mood disorders because of her difficult childhood. Uh, but it wasn't anywhere compared to what you faced. And that's why I could feel the connection. That's why I wrote that message to you in 2010, 11, saying I want to volunteer. My question to you is right now, a lot of people seem to be going through hell, you know, not just the pandemic, but also the divisiveness that we see. Just the, so many challenges, economic hardship. Um, what can people do? Because it's very tempting to get stuck in the negative cycle. Then the, you know, the fight, flight, the fight, flight or freeze mode and not be able to get out of it. Seemingly, it's like a, such a huge burden that most people who have never faced something like this are getting into amygdala hijacking, to use the technical term. My question to you is, what can you, both as a scientist, as a human being who has been through these challenges, how can they go beyond the negativity into a cycle and start growing? Because these are the times when there's a potential for major growth because it's out of the comfort zone. What can people do and how, how should they approach it? Well, it's a difficult question. And uh, first of all, uh, prior to the pandemic and prior to the uh, tragic death of George Floyd and other uh, individuals of color who have suffered at the hands of police and a um, racist society, uh, there are literally millions, uh, if not billions of people suffering. Uh, you know, if you look at the world even today, uh, half the world's population lives on $2.50 a day or less. And 
the most horrible, horrible uh, tragedies, circumstances uh, occur daily. So I don't want to imply uh, that there's not immense suffering going on every day. Uh, that being said, um, you know, there are many people who uh, also have lived, as an example, in the United States. Uh, they've seen over the last uh, number of decades essentially the erosion of the ability to be in the middle, cla the middle class or, uh, if you will, go up in class socioeconomically in American society. The reality is that this is in great part due to income inequality, uh, where the rich get richer, as an example, 82% of all new wealth in 2017 went to 1% of the people. You know, 400 people have more assets in the United States than 150 million at the lower uh, end of the economy. So there are a lot of very, very bad things going on. And in fact, someone once said, if you want to live the American dream, go to Denmark because they have uh -huh. the, low, the lowest levels of um, income inequality and the ability to change class uh, because people are more equal. That being said, in the present circumstance, it is a horrible circumstance. Uh, and I cannot minimize that. Uh, you know, having all sorts of platitudes to say it's going to get better and, uh, you know, just hang in there, frankly, uh, are fucking irritating. Uh, so I don't want to say that. Uh, it is a tough time for many people. I cannot minimize that. Uh, I cannot magically um, make that change immediately. What I would suggest are a couple of things. Uh, one is, as you know, uh, suffering. Uh, oftentimes has to do with attachment and craving. And, uh, you know, the craving for, well, I wish it was like the old way. I wish it was like it was before all this happened. And in some ways, this is uh, resistance to reality and non-acceptance. And in some ways, that's the other side of the coin of attachment. You refuse to accept reality, uh, the new norm, if you will. And I think one of the things uh, that we all have to do is to accept the present reality. Because if you keep resisting, you're not able to plan and deal with how to appropriately react. You keep hoping for something to be different. Uh, so all you can deal with is the present moment and that reality. So I think the very nature of being accepting and then Say, okay, this is the situation, now how do I correctly plan? Because when you're in resistance mode, when you're in attachment mode, uh, what happens is um, you're not processing things clearly. You are, um, on the one hand, uh, engaging um, in your sympathetic nervous system, which creates stress and anxiety, of course, but it also shuts down your executive control function and as a result, you're not as thoughtful, as discerning, or able to process. The other side is uh, when you're in the attachment craving mode, it essentially does the same thing because it also hijacks you in a different way. And so once you accept reality and not be stressed about that in the sense of getting lost in that, then you can start looking at things much more objectively. Now, the other thing I would say is that uh, um, oftentimes one of the things we attach to, uh, which relates to what I was just saying, is acknowledgement of accomplishment or having succeeded or so at something. And uh, that's all wonderful. The problem is that you have to look at that uh, with the same clear eyes as you look at stressful and very difficult times like what many are living through today. And this is the nature of equanimity. Uh, this evenness of temperament, where you understand that all of this is transitory. And, uh, and for many, many people, if you look back, uh, or if they look back, and I certainly know this is true of my life, uh, when, um, I was in dire poverty when I was hungry, 
when I uh, was evicted, it was a horrible situation at the time. I mean, it, I cannot tell you how bad it was. That being said, with the perspective of time, those experiences have taught me resilience, have taught me who I am, have given me life lessons about uh, who is truly a kind person of integrity uh, versus who is living a lie. And what I mean by that is that oftentimes we make heroes of people who uh, have no attributes that deserve them being considered a hero. As an example, uh, you can look at uh, uh, one of our uh, presidents. Uh, uh, and, you know, you look at a person who um, chronically and pathologically is dishonest, and you sit there and go, wow, this person has wealth, they have power, but how many of us would really want to be in that individual's situation or circumstance and to live with the burden of what that person does? And this isn't just uh, politicians. Uh, you know, this is other people who, quote unquote, have succeeded in society. Some of the most unhappy, ruthless, unkind, negative individuals I've ever met are people who have been acknowledged for their, quote unquote, success in society. I'll tell you a quick story. I used to work in a liquor store when I was in high school. I mean, in college. And every day a man came in very disheveled and bought a quart of vodka. And being the unenlightened jerk, I would give him a hard time. And uh, one day he confronted and called me on it. Okay. And he said, Who, what right do I have to judge him? Uh, and um, he was right. And he proceeded to tell me his story. And his story was that his <clears throat> wife had tragically died, I believe, from cancer. And his only daughter, who <clears throat> sort of had been the rock after this, died in a car accident. Oh. So he felt he had nothing, no anchors, nothing to live for, and having to live <clears throat> with the memories, not of the good times in his mind, but of the tragedies uh, resulted in him spiraling down into uh, alcoholism. And I was ashamed, embarrassed, felt horrible, but uh, he was right for calling me on it because I have no right to judge him and I knew nothing about him. But a long, the long story short of this is that this allowed he and I to engage in a dialogue. And he would still come in every day, but we, he would sometimes then sit down and we would just chat for a couple hours. And he was a former college professor. Okay. And eventually what happened is he went from a court uh, to a pint, to one of those airplane bottles, <laughs> and would come and not come in every day, every two days, and then every three days. And over this progression of many months, he also went from being dressed completely slovenly in dirty clothes to coming in with a sport coat and looking prof uh, professorial with a haircut. And over time, he stopped buying alcohol at all. Oh, wow, what a story. In fact, uh, I mean, um, this illustrates the power of listening and just being there. And, uh, and also of our arrogance sometimes in judging people. Yes. And so he gave me an extraordinarily profound education and lesson and his friendship. And obviously, I, in some way, uh, contributed to his own recovery. And he shifted also from ruminating on uh, what might have been and the tragedy 
to also thinking of the wonderful, extraordinary memories he had, because no, none of us are guaranteed uh, that our loved ones are going to live beyond today. Uh, the tragedy is not going to occur as we're seeing around us. Uh, so all you can do is live with the energy of those who have been present for you in your life and also uh, the possibilities of how these challenging circumstances allow us to actually connect deeply with others. We see repeated stories of extraordinary kindness where people have reached out in the most difficult of circumstances. So in some ways, the situation gives us an opportunity uh, to be our best selves, even in the face of uh, very, very challenging uh, circumstances. So I think uh, I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything, but in the face of these things, I think you can also see um, wonderful stories of how uh, our humanity shines through and serves as a beacon uh, for others to um, act um, and be their best selves. And in fact, uh, what I'm noticing, Jim, is that uh, people like you who are like super busy are giving so much of your time right now uh, to be there of service to people I know you've been doing at least about four or five shows every week. I almost thought maybe he's doing this full time and then I realized you have a full plate of things going on. Can you tell us how you manage your time? Something simple like this, but what motivates you to continue with all the work you're doing and you're doing a lot of things and being a family man with kids at home. Tell us a little bit about how you manage so that it can help us. Many people are right now overwhelmed and are trying to juggle things that were unexpected? Well, uh, certainly I would say I am in no way perfect and I procrastinate about certain things, uh, uh, hopefully ones that aren't that particularly important. But uh, that being said, um, you know, there's a, a, a quote that many people will say, if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. And, <laughs> Uh, and the reason is, is because there is a subset of individuals who, for whatever reason, have the ability to juggle many things. And I have to tell you that a number of the things that I do, as an example, uh, you know, we published this handbook of compassion science, Oxford University Press. Oh, well, is I'm, it already out now? Uh, yeah, is it it's already been in the press? For years. Uh, oh, so wow. The Oxford Handbook of Compassion Science. But the reason I mention that is while I'm the senior editor, my contribution uh, was the concept, the idea, and overseeing it. But 90% of the work was done by others. And, uh, and even Seek Care itself, while I often get the accolades of uh, creating the concept, the idea, overseeing it, the work really is done by so many others who have the motivation and the intention of spreading compassion in the world. So the reality is my burden is often lifted uh, by the kindness and support of so many other people. You know, it's an interesting phenomenon. We see highly successful people, uh, especially uh, where I'm at in Silicon Valley, and they'll um, stand in front of a group of people and say, I did this, you know, it was my idea, I nurtured it, I put it all together, and I, I, I. And there is not a successful person alive who's done anything by themselves. <clears throat> and uh, for them to uh, have the ego to imply that is just a, a, a falsehood. Uh, as an example, you look at many people who um, have come from uh, very affluent backgrounds. Uh, the nature of that affluence has resulted in them having the best educational opportunities. Uh, and the ability to afford to go to uh, an Ivy League school, as an example, and then due to the nature of contacts, mentors, access, uh, you know, they function at the highest levels of society. And then they sit there and go, well, I did this. Well, they did nothing other than show up. 
And I don't mean to imply that they didn't put forth effort, but they had every, every gift and opportunity. And uh, unfortunately, they forget what that uh, contributes to their success. You know, I, in my own personal experience, because of the nature of my background, have seen extraordinarily bright, uh, intelligent, motivated individuals who, by the nature of their struggles, uh, have just been so worn down that they give up. And it's a horrible, horrible thing uh, to see someone gifted and thoughtful and kind uh, give up because that typically translates into drug and alcohol abuse, mental illness even, or just finally uh, just acceptance that uh, they're never going to achieve uh, their full potential and they carry that every day. So I would say that all of us who've accomplished anything uh, should be grateful to all of those who uh, supported, who've been there for us, who've given us uh, their time and energy and mentored us. And I believe in this woman in this magic shop whose name was Ruth, one of her statements uh, to me was to uh, uh, utilize my own abilities to uh, help lighten the load and the burden of others. And uh, I hopefully have tried to do that in my own life. Yes, indeed. In fact, um, one of the challenges I went through going through life was that having come out of poverty, um, the ego just went up the roof. And uh, I remember the days, uh, many of my closest friends and family remind me, there was a time when I was just another arrogant, you know, words that I cannot use here. But the reality is that I was lucky to have gone through challenges after that, both my emotional life and my factual life. And then that changed, shifted things. And I found people like you, I found many, many mentors along the way and brought that humility. Um, so I guess in some ways it's cultivated in some ways life brings us situations that change us. And I'm grateful because otherwise I don't know where I would be today. Um, do you have any advice for people on how they can utilize whatever good and bad situations they are in today and redirect their energy or find the kind of mentors they want maybe or to use the opportunities they have to do something that they'll be proud of 10 years from now something that they can be they can cherish i made a difference to myself and to others around me is there something people can do intentionally or is it always by synchronicity or accident what can people do intentionally to go in that meaningful direction? Well, uh, certainly it would be nice if um, the, those opportunities were readily available. You know, what I tell people is that every day, each of us, regardless of our circumstance, uh, has the ability to positively change one person's life, period. And that can some, simply uh, sometimes be um, by saying hello. Um, as an example, uh, I was related a story of an individual who he was a, um, I guess, a resident assistant in the dorms at Stanford. And uh, every day there was a girl who would sit in the common area and he would pass her by and she would never say hello. And she even had a hard time looking him in the eye. Yet for three months, he persisted every day to stop And say hello and finally after these months he did it and the woman looked at him and uh, she broke out and she said uh, thank you uh, I know I never acknowledged it uh, no one has ever made an effort over and over to be kind to me and I refuse to accept it uh, until today. And so <clears throat> even in that difficult circumstance where this poor person was suffering and felt they did not even deserve to be acknowledged, uh, his repeated kindness of simply saying hello finally got through to her and actually it changed her life. 
Uh, the other thing is I would say is that one of the hardest lessons to learn is to be non-judgmental. And you know, it's an inherent part of us because in some ways it's an evolutionary construct that uh, has been useful to us in the past and it's a shortcut. Uh, and your senses, your brain look for shortcuts because as I said earlier, you can't process all the data. And so as an example, we have a tendency and just to use something that's uh, relative to uh, what's happening today, for many white people, they'll see an Afro-American uh, and they'll cross the street uh and they're making a judgment uh and the reality is that while certainly sometimes uh these activities can be protective other times uh they actually create situations that make it worse you know, imagine how you would feel if every time you walk down the street somebody avoids you and looks in the other direction or makes assumptions about you as an example as a poor 12 year old walking into the store, you know, uh, oftentimes the assumption is you're shoplifting or you don't belong there or you're bad. And so I think uh, what we should try to do is to uh, be more um, non-judgmental and also even in the context of reactivity to events, uh, instead of having the immediate response, which is again, a protective response, as an example, if a person comes on to you aggressively, uh, pause and think about why they may possibly be doing that and temper uh, your response. And this is something that we find in uh, Viktor Frankl's work of Mind Ser Man's Search for Meaning. And this is the statement of between stimulus and response is a pause. And within that pause lies our freedom. And so I think that's also uh, a very important thing. I'll tell you another story, which I have infinite ones. <laughs> I was involved in a uh, challenging lawsuit where I sued someone who misappropriated uh, a charitable donation I gave, and it was a significant donation. And my wife told me to forget it, but I said it was a matter of principle and I didn't care how much time or energy it cost to deal with the situation. Uh, so after grueling several hours with attorneys in a downtown uh, San Jose office, um, I left by myself to go have lunch. And this is in a, a metropolitan area and uh, um, a number of minorities. And you know, as I was walking out of this uh, building, I was thinking to myself, geez, you know, I'm such a sucker. I had given this money. You know, my wife tells me to be more thoughtful, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Maybe I'm just a schmuck. Uh, I should be much more uh, suspicious of people's uh, motivations, et cetera, et cetera. So as I'm having my head down, walking along, thinking about this, heading to this outdoor restaurant, I passed through the parking lot of, or the uh, a gas station. Uh, and as I'm walking past, uh, I get tapped on the shoulder. And it's an Afro American uh, young man, probably in his early 20s, not dressed particularly well, who asked me for some money. And I've just been reliving about what a sucker I am in my mind. And, uh, you know, I think about this, I go, Am I just going to be a sucker again? He's probably going to use this for drugs, et cetera. And what the guy said when he tapped me on the shoulder was, it was interesting. He said, you know, sir, uh, uh, my car broke down and uh, I need bus fare for my mother and myself to get back home. Now, I don't see a car. I don't see a mother. I don't see anything. So immediately I'm suspicious. And I looked at him and, I, and uh, for a second in my mind, he said, so what am I going to do? Am I just going to walk by and ignore the guy? Or am I going to give him the benefit of the doubt? So I went ahead and I gave him $5. And as soon as I walked away, I started beating myself up a second time. Like, what an idiot. I just re-demonstrated what a fool I am. <laughs> so I then go to this uh, restaurant and I order my food. I go sit outside at this table. I'm sitting there again. I'm sitting there like this with my head down, again, reliving this whole thing. And uh, I feel a tap on my shoulder. And lo and behold, it's this Afro-American kid. And he's with his mother. 
And he, wow. says, he says to me, he says, you know, you were so kind to me. <clears throat> you know, you didn't give me a hard time. And I just wanted to introduce my mother to you. Wow. So now, while that's not always going to be the case, I would much rather live a life of giving people uh, the benefit of the doubt than being suspicious of every person's uh, motivations. In fact, uh, that brings me to another point. Uh, sea care, of course, changed the lives of thousands and thousands of people, including me. It gave me a clear sense of direction, along with many things I was doing. I wonder, Jim, in what ways has Sika changed your life? And did you find mentors? Did you find a renewed sense of energy? I'm just wondering how Sika, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and um, Education at Stanford, how did it change you and others who really created this noble cause? Well, uh, I had left Stanford, and when I came back to Stanford in 2008, uh, this I was feeling a burden of trying to understand what are the drivers that make people do good or not. And, uh, and it came down to compassion. And when I finally returned, uh, I decided to dedicate myself to understand uh, this. And my, my hypothesis was that uh, compassionate behavior is the a fundamental core of our humanity and that it has uh, positive benefits even though oftentimes compassion in our modern society is perceived as weakness or uh, you know, you're, you're uh, letting people walk all over you. And in fact, when I first presented this hypothesis to many colleagues in neuroscience and psychology, uh, the idea that um, studying compassion could be beneficial uh, was just immediately dismissed. And in fact, I was told it was an academic dead end. Now, fortunately, I didn't listen to any of them, and in fact, uh, funded research. And uh, actually, some of those researchers ended up changing their entire academic field of research to compassion, because the data was so powerful. Uh, how uh, acting compassionately uh, positively impacts your reward centers, how it affects your physiology, and ultimately, an understanding that from an evolutionary perspective, perspective, it's what allowed our species to survive. You know, for me personally, what the gift of sea care has done is that while I am an atheist, if you will, uh, it has allowed me to engage and develop relationships with some of the most iconic spiritual and religious leaders in the world. And I found that just an extraordinary, amazing blessing. And, you know, people say, what is it like to spend time with the Dalai Lama or Amma, the hugging saint, or Sri Sri, or Sadguru, or Radhana Swami, or Chinananda, or uh, Desmond Tutu, or Thich Nhat Hanh, Eckhart Tolle. And I've had the joy and pleasure to spend time with all of these individuals. And it's interesting because what I tell people is that, you know, unfortunately in modern society, because of fear of judgment, we try to protect ourselves with this cloak of telling people what we've accomplished and who we are so we don't have to show them our suffering and our authentic selves. And, uh, and as a result of that, it's a heavy psychological burden. You know, when people ask you about yourself, uh, you typically say, well, I'm a doctor, I did this, I did that, da, 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 da. And the problem is that you do that so you are protected from how you feel for being judged. And when you're with somebody like the Dalai Lama or Amma or some of these other individuals, they accept you unconditionally and it's amazing because when you're around those people to get unconditional embracing radiant love it's like uh, you're released you're floating you don't have to carry this projection of how you want people to see you because it doesn't matter uh, you are immediately accepted with all your perceived faults with your shadow 
And it's an extraordinary, extraordinary joy and uplifting feeling to be that way. You know, um, centuries ago, when we lived in small villages, uh, you know, most of us, uh, uh, you grew up in an environment where people knew you from the time you were born. You had generational living situation. You, your neighbors were with you your entire life. They knew everything about you and you had no uh, need for pretensions. And if you look at these areas in the world now, which are called blue zones where people live like that, they routinely lived to over a century. And the reason is, is because they don't carry the burden of being judged, they're accepted. And that has a huge, huge positive physiologic effect. Also social connection, being with people who are accepting of you. Also exercise in moderation. Also oftentimes uh, a Mediterranean diet or, or a diet in moderation. And, uh, but the most important thing is the social connection acceptance part. So being around individuals who live that, uh, it just uh, is amazing. And people say, well, I don't understand that. How can these people embrace you? You're not a follower. Uh, you don't know any of their scriptures or texts. And what I tell people, and it's interesting, is in all the interactions I've had with these people, I've never had a discussion about any of those things. I've never been asked. I've never had a discussion. You know, I'm exactly with them as I am with you. And uh, But what I will tell you is, you know, an evolved spiritual leader only is interested in do you care? Do you unconditionally love? Are you non-judgmental? Are you your authentic self? And if you are that, they embrace you. Uh, and, but they can uh, smell inauthenticity immediately. Uh, you know, and these people are above the dogma. You know, the dogma in some ways is for people to have ritual, uh, to create community. But if you tease out the fundamental core tenets of every religion, it's all about social connection, compassion, and love. And I think that's what sometimes people forget. You know, I, literally I've had people say, you know, I've memorized this and this and this, and I've been following this person for 20 years, and, you know, this is unfair. And the very nature of a statement like that demonstrates that they've not learned the text adequately. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like people who come up to you and they'll go, you know, I'm on my third 10-day silent Vipassana retreat. What the fuck does that mean? I, I, I mean, you don't have to tell me how many retreats you Is this a contest? But this is the problem of ego, right? These people are, even in the face of these incredible, extraordinary teachings, are still locked up in their ego to prove their superiority of their practice over your practice. And it's a very, very uh, sad thing to watch for someone to have spent years and in the face of it, not get it. And this is why there are some people, they don't need any scriptures or any text. Fundamentally, they understand at a very deep level what this life is all about. And there are others who they can read every scripture there is for their particular genre of religion, and they'll never pass beyond a kindergarten. Uh, and it's, it's sort of sad. Uh, so, in summary, I would say that the true nature of reality is understanding that um, the greatest thing we can do is transcendence. And what I mean by that is if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, and there's um, actually a new book, uh, by a guy named Kaufman, I believe. It's called Transcendence. But he talks about the work of Maslow, and which, of course, in the traditional pyramid, if you will, you have self-actualization. And I've given yeah. this lecture for many years. Self-actualization is great, but the next step beyond that is transcendence. And transcendence is when you understand um, the nature of reality, which is oneness. What you do for the other is you doing for yourself. 
And if you look at the other as yourself and how you respond to them, then you make no errors in how you behave. And I think this is uh, really a, a very important um, thing. You know, there's a quote, and I can't remember by who, but basically the quote says, at the end of your days, when your children speak of integrity, values, and love, they think of you. If you can aspire to that, you've done your job. Wow, wow, so true, so true. In fact, it's interesting you mentioned about the three Vipassanas because I did my third Vipassana and I used to talk about that. And at the end of the third Vipassana, I realized that I had a huge spiritual ego and uh, that it was about time to shed that spiritual ego. I think it was the Buddha who himself said that uh, when you are in you know normal day-to-day -day life in in samsara or in day-to-day -day life, uh, you feel like you're tied in ropes, but then you get on this path of transcendence, and guess what? You, there are no longer ropes, but now you have silk knots. These knots are much harder to get rid of. He was warning people of the risk of the a spiritual ego developing. These silk knots are much harder to take off than the ropes of jute or the ropes of and um, I'm so glad you mentioned that because uh, we all get, you know, almost territorial when it comes to our so-called religious or spiritual practice or, or even our science. You um, know, there's, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, please go ahead. I want, to hear, I want to hear from you how you have been able to go beyond that because I see you continue to learn. I see like you're still a student of life and that's amazing. Well, uh, you know, the thing is, we can learn from everyone, just like I learned from what I presume to be an uneducated alcoholic. Uh, everyone has a story, and we can learn from everyone's story. Uh, but I was going to tell you another story related to uh, the comments we were just talking about, and it's there's a llama and a student, and they're standing by the banks of a, a river, and they meet a woman and she needs to cross the river, but it's too rapid for her size. She's a small lady. So immediately the Lama offers to carry her across. And the student is aghast that he would violate his, uh, rit uh, his um, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, Vows or dharma. By touching this woman and carrying her across. And he's just appalled by this, but the, guy, the monk Lama carries her across, and they get to the other side. He drops her off, and they go on their way. And about a mile and a half later, uh, the student monk, if you will, he says, I can't, you know, be silent anymore. Uh, you know, I can't believe you did that. You violated your vows. This is horrible. I respected you. And the Lama looks at him, and he says, uh, I uh, left the woman at the bank. You continue to carry her, right? And I think this is the problem is that, you know, instead of ending things and understanding, uh, some things have no import whatsoever, uh, and you just drop them, some people carry these burdens and they impact them. And in some ways it's like anger uh, and the nature of forgiveness. And this is not to forget, but, you know, people carry anger and hostility towards another. And in fact, what I say is it's, you know, you look at memories. Memories are not a photograph. What a memory is, is a painting uh, which you have created based on an experience. And the colors you use are the colors of emotion. And then you put that painting into your memory. And every time you think of that event, you see that painting. And that painting may have nothing to do with reality, but for many people, it has a very negative uh, effect on them. And you know, an event is an event. It's neither good nor bad. It's how you interpret it. And I think that that's the problem, is that 
you know, you need to look at these events as a black and white picture, and that's all they are. And understand that you create your own suffering oftentimes by how you're painting these pictures. And this also goes back to this issue of, you know, there can't be peace in the world until you have inner peace. You know, if you're constantly at war inside of yourself, uh, you can't be effective outside as a peacemaker. And so I think that um, when you're able to be able to sit with yourself, accept who you are, and that includes all your perceived failings, your shadow, and stop trying to hide your shadow, but live with your shadow. Uh, because, you know, when you hide your shadow, that part of you that you hate about yourself, that uh, keeps reminding you of your, um, if you will, failed humanity, at least in your mind, uh, you suffer because it pops up at the least opportune times uh, versus understanding it's never going to go away and you just have to accept it. And once you accept it, then you can be more calm, you can control it much more, and you can be um, at peace with yourself. But many people uh, still struggle with that, and it's a very heavy burden. You know, I tell people, and you know my story, uh, and I've shared some of it. Um, you know, I, I uh, even after this time with Ruth, I carried uh, shame still, and this idea that I wasn't good enough, and I went on this course and made this list of goals uh, to show that I was worthy. And you know, whether it was going to college, going to medical school, becoming a professor, becoming a successful entrepreneur, I still never felt worthy. And when I lost all of my money and was effectively bankrupt, you know, I spent a lot of period of time reflecting on my, the trajectory of my life. And uh, it turned out that uh, I had to sell everything. You know, I had a penthouse in San Francisco, I had Ferraris, Porsches, all sorts of things. I ended up having to get rid of them to pay the bankers. And interestingly enough, I had donated stock in a company uh, to uh, charity. And as I was going through all the legal process of uh, bankruptcy, although I didn't officially go bankrupt, but I had to go through all of my assets and everything. Uh, the lawyers came to me and they said, you know, you had created this document to donate all of the stock you had to charity, but it turns out we never filed the documents. So you don't really have to do that. You don't have to give all this money away, which was actually stock in a company that had yet to go public. Uh, um, and you can uh, just keep the money. And you know, certainly if you've lost everything and you're bankrupt effectively, that's a generous uh, position to be in. But after a period of reflection, I decided not to change that and to honor my original commitment. And when that company did go public, um, I gave, had ended up giving tens and tens of millions of dollars away to charity. But the thing about making that decision was the monkey that had been on my back that had been driving me was try to prove to other people that I was worthy by these accomplishments, which in some level had to do with power and money. And when I voluntarily essentially threw that money away from myself, um, that's when I truly started living. So when I had nothing is when I got everything. Wow, wow, really amazing to hear that from you. And I've heard it uh, in different ways in the past. And another thing I noticed, uh, Jim, I know we are pretty much out of time, but one quick question. Werner Erhard was a big influence on my life when I was 18. I'd been through many religious, uh, you know, um, yoga and many other things. And then came Werner. And I noticed you have not only interviewed him at Seeker, but also met with him and his wife, I think, recently. Please tell me, was Werner a part of your journey? Uh, because, you know, Est and the landmark, very controversial in certain ways, but it was a big part of my life journey. 
and I'm very grateful. So what was he, his role in your life? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that. And in some ways, people ask me about the Dalai Lama, blah, blah, blah. blah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you another story if you have a few more minutes. Yes, yes, indeed. So I had actually met Warner, and now it's been about 15 years ago, the very first time. Uh, and I was at a dinner uh, of eight people. My uh, Masha, my wife, had... Uh, uh, I think just delivered our son or a few months before. But we went to this dinner and it was probably one of our first nights out after the baby was born. And so uh, it was hosted by a very prominent neurosurgeon, uh, you know, in his 70s at that time, who his wife had been profoundly affected by Warner. Uh, I mean, as she were just saying, it changed her life. And, and he's changed the lives truly of millions of people, although controversial. Uh, and there was a former Secretary of State of Human or Health and Services or something, as well as uh, my wife and myself and Warner and his assistant at that time, who's now his wife. Now, I don't know if you know Warner's backstory, but uh, you know, he, his name I think was Rosenberg, uh, Paul, maybe Paul, I can't remember. But anyway, he was a Jewish kid from Philadelphia. And he impregnated his high school sweetheart, had four kids, abandoned her, moved to the West Coast, started selling encyclopedias, got involved with uh, um, um, Dianetics, I think. Of Scientology. Scientology, yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, and then developed EST as he was driving across the uh, Golden Gate Bridge and sort of saw uh, this vision of being, if you will. So anyway, uh, we were at this dinner with him. I had not met him before, but I was aware of him. And so he was talking about a new program he was developing about integrity. And I looked at him and I said, I find it interesting that you talk about integrity when you abandoned your wife and children uh, and, you know, recreated yourself and did nothing for them. And my wife kicked me at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he looked at me and without uh, skipping a beat, he said, you're absolutely right for bringing that up. Uh, uh, you know, it's something I'm not proud of. Uh, I accept full responsibility. I've tried to make amends since then. And, um, you know, that was sort of it. And now you could argue, well, that could be a sociopath uh, who just is making some statement. He's so intelligent, he's already created an answer. Uh, or it could be someone who's very insightful and has learned and uh, is practicing that now. I still don't necessarily have the complete answer for you. Uh, but subsequent to that, I never talked to him again for 13 years. So one day I was walking around and I was trying to think of who to invite to Stanford and his name popped in my head, you know, for a conversation on compassion. So I uh, looked and I still had the email of his assistant. And I emailed her and amazingly, within two hours, she responded. Up for, and, you know, and they were living in, in uh, London at the time. And within two hours, she responds and she says, this is the most incredible case of synchronicity literally Warner and I were at dinner earlier today and your name came up and she said uh, <coughs> he indicated how badly he felt that he didn't reach out to you later and learn more about you uh, because he was really interested in you and thought you were a very interesting person. So <laughs> this led to him coming and do in a conversation on compassion, which was very well attended. I spent three days with him, <coughs> my wife and I, and now his wife and um, him. We became actually close friends, which I continue to be today. And as you point out, I was recently in London and had dinner with him and his wife. And it was just an amazing event. And I had wonderful times with him. And I will tell you, though, I have never taken Est. I've never taken Land <laughs> <Warm> or anything. <laughs> And it's like many other practices, whether it was religious practices or spiritual, um, it's, it's the transcendence. It's not necessarily the course or that particular 
dharma or that particular path. Um, yes, I, I accidentally happened when I was 18 years old. That was the first American course I took. And there are a lot of cuss words they used in those days. Oh, yeah. In 1982. He still does. He still does. <laughs> I but, did too. Uh, so <coughs> I don't mind that so much. You know, they say if you use cuss words, it's a sign of intelligence. <laughs> I that, but, but, uh, it was life transformative and I was very puzzled when um, you invited him to seek care. I think it was four years ago. And I tried to sign up. It was all sold out. It was probably the fastest sellout for a seeker event because um, you know what I mean? Um, very well, much there, yeah, there were, I think, 650 people there. You should have dropped me an email. I would have made sure. <laughs> but I mean, I had met him before in Bombay once a long time ago. And I, you know, like anything else, I kind of learned and then move on. So I moved away from West and never did landmark. At all. But well, you know, it's interesting because if you look at all the conversations I've done on uh, conversations on compassion, you know, the ones that are most popular are him, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle. Uh, the Dalai Lama, and Amma. Wow, interesting, interesting. Yes, yes. And yes, I mean, I cherish every single talk. Um, maybe it's time for me to go back. I have not heard Werner's talk at Seekers. So I'm going to do that. Um, but I'm so grateful that you've done these, um, um, you know, wonderful events and are now available to talk to people like me and to hundreds of people in many. Are there any upcoming events that are coming up, Jim, where we could, people could see you live? Well, actually, uh, Warner and I are doing a thing on August 11th. Fantastic. And where is that going to be? It's going to be at Stanford, although, of course, with the pandemic situation, we're trying to decide. It may end up being a Zoom uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. Uh, he has a new book. I should say he has a new book. There is a book recently written uh, called, uh, is it Simply Bean? Or, um, uh -huh. you know, uh, check it out. Uh, uh, and in fact, I wrote a blurb for the book. He asked me to. Uh, but uh, he and I are going to talk about that book. And it's a comparison of the philosophy of Est and of uh, being and Martin Heidegger's concept of time and being. It's oh, actually a very deep philosophical, uh, uh, actually, discussion. And he's going to do a reading from the book. Um, so uh, that should uh, be interesting. So we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, let's see, do we have anything else coming up? Uh, unfortunately, I've had to ca cancel a few things. Um, I'm going to do a thing with Biden soon. Uh, Joe Biden? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'll let people know about that when we finish all the details. But uh, yeah, uh, there you have it. Uh, so I appreciate you having me. Uh, also, you know, we talked about uh, uh, my background. Uh, as you know, there's a book I wrote, a memoir that incorporates neuroscience and contemplative practice uh, called Into the Magic Shop, A Neurosurgeon's Quest to Discover the Mysteries of the Brain and the Secrets of the Heart. You know, the book is now in, I think, over 40 languages. Uh, it uh, was a New York Times bestseller. If you look at Amazon, I think it's got over a thousand reviews and it's still a uh, five stars. Uh, and in fact, the Korean K-pop group, uh, uh, BTS, uh, used my book as the basis of, I think, for their third album and a song called uh, Magic Shop. Oh, wow, there's a song. I'm yeah. gonna find it right now, wow. It's, it's in Korean, so I, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Still, uh, very, very popular among a lot of uh, young people and some older people, I presume. Uh, um, and in fact, uh, we're having discussions right now about a movie about the book. So, um, Very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Now, in yeah. Korean, is it? No, 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 no. no. In English. This will, this will be uh, by actually, I can't say the name at the moment, but a fairly well-known movie star. Um, now, my wife wanted George Clooney, but, uh, or, or, or um, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, but I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, uh, she's happy with this potential person as well. 
And so uh, also, if anyone's interested in the work that we do at CCARE, you can find us at CCARE, ccare.stanford.edu. And if any of the listeners uh, want to reach out to me directly, uh, you can easily find my email address, jrdoty at stanford.edu. Wow, thank you again for your generosity in terms of being available to people. And um, I will put some of these links, uh, whatever I can find from you, uh, in this conversation at the end of the conversation. Um, again, we will we have these uh, discussions soaring through chaos so that we can all learn from each other. Jim has been a constant learner, and I so appreciate that. I learned that from him, that at no point in my life, until I'm alive, would I think I know it all. So again, thank you, Jim, and I'm so grateful for everything I've learned and continue to learn. Well, this is the nature of looking at the world through a beginner's mind. And if you can do that, you've already are well ahead in the game of life. Thanks again. Have a Thanks. good day. See you. Namaste. Bye.